mid-range narcissist. Pity play. I'm going to provide you with an example of a pity play issued by a mid-range narcissist. And I will then provide you with the analysis of the constituent parts of the overarching pity play so you understand the relevant aspects of the narcissistic dynamic and the narcissistic indicators. Any mid-range narcissist will utilize this pity play, but typically it would be used by middle mid-range type A or middle mid-range type B. Middle mid-range type A are either anodyne, very vanilla narcissists, middle of the road, or false angels, overwhelming angels, falling over themselves to be helpful. Middle mid-range type B are crybabies. They think the universe has cursed them and the world is against them. This pity play is being utilised towards an appliance. It could be said to the intimate partner primary source, possibly intimate partner secondary source, and even in some instances to a non-intimate secondary source, probably between family members, either parent to child or adult child, narcissist towards victim parent. Most typically, you would hear it in an intimate setting. I'll provide you with the pity play and then the analysis thereafter. I don't know what you want. Heaven knows I have tried. Every day, I have spent my time in pursuit of your happiness. It was easy at first, because you seemed so happy. I don't think I had seen anybody who acted in such a carefree manner. Nothing seemed to bother you hold you back, or distract you. You moved with such intent, acted with defined purpose, and I must confess I found that attractive. The singularity of your aim was evident to even the most casual of observers. You shrugged off mishaps, shirked disaster, and dodged catastrophe, as if you had once pledged that you would never countenance anything that could hinder or hold you back. It is admirable and impressive." With that ability to glide effortlessly through life, you always seemed happy, or at least that is what I thought. You made me happy too. Goodness knows you did. You did it better than anybody else, and with such conviction. I can place my hand on my heart and confirm that I have never experienced anybody like you. Your capacity for love exceeded anything I had witnessed before. Everything else paled next to you and your blazing golden sunshine. You chased away the gloom, you lit up the darkest of days, and you always did with such confidence and fortitude. It was easy to love you. You made it easy. Who wouldn't love a god who had deigned to walk on the earth in such a manner? Of all of the billions making their way across this planet, you came and you chose me. Me. Two small letters, yet you made those letters fill your life and there was no room for anything else. I had never been the focus of such love, attention and affection. And do you know, I doubt I ever will again. There is nobody like you. I mean that as a compliment. I honestly do. Nobody loved me the way that you did. If I had not seen it happening and felt it envelop me, I would never believe it. And believe in it I did with every ounce of my being. You know, I almost felt obliged to love you. How could I not do so after all the things that you did for me and everything that you said? I would surely be a cold-hearted individual to have denied you the most perfect love after what you showed me. I could no less reciprocate what you gave me than walk away, and I feel hard and deep inside for you so that it made loving you easy. I gave everything for you. But, if I am honest, at least at first, it was no chore, no arduous exercise or thorny path. It was bliss. You invigorated me, you elated me, and you inspired me. You became the centre of my world, and thus I loved you in every conceivable way that I could, with my eyes, my mouth, my fingers, my breath, and my heart. I woke, and the first thing I thought of was you. 
I found you filling my thoughts often and repeatedly, as I considered how best I could return your wonderful love. I sculpted my life around yours as I cooked for you, I shopped for you, I listened to you and I counselled you. I soothed your fevered brow and held your clammy hand as you slipped into a chaotic slumber. I laundered your clothes, I searched for your keys, I supported your endeavours and I lauded your achievements. I made myself the best person you could ever want by your side and I strove each and every day to maintain our happiness for our perfect union. I invested everything I had in our partnership, as I wanted to be Robin to your Batman, Hutch to your Starsky, and the Sundance Kid to your Butch Cassidy. I portrayed nothing less than the perfect visage to all of those who admire you, the bended knee people, the hand kissers, the bowing people, and those at your elbow and over your shoulders. I gave them no reason to doubt us, to doubt you. I smiled when the pain tried to prevent me from doing so. I blinked back the tears when they wanted to pour. I searched for answers, even when I began to realise that no, n that none would be forthcoming. You made me twist, turn and dangle, as you had me like Don Quixote, tilting at those windmills, because they might be dragons. You made me think that enemies lurked behind every corner, their long-fingered jealousy ready to steal what we had. I searched for them, ready to strike them down in furtherance of what we have, because I believed in you and I. I gave every minute of every day to you. I cancelled my plans. I let friends loose and I irked my family in order to give you what I thought you wanted. I cleaned, I worked, I bathed, I trimmed, I cut, I dieted, I measured, I washed, and I did so all because of you. I have come so far along the road with you that I was not going to stop because somehow I knew that we would succeed. All I had to do was find what it was that you wanted. That is me. You see, I am a giver and you are a receiver. That does not pain me because I have spent most of my life being a provider and a giver. That is why I was put on the earth to care, to worry, to look after and to cherish. That is my role. And I have discharged myself in this role with utter dedication and distinction. I know I can lie straight in the bed, even more so because you no longer frequent it with me, and do so in the knowledge that I have done everything I could for you. You could not want for more. You could not want for a better person than I. You were the best for me, and I wanted the best for you too. They say that when you are going through hell, you should just keep going. But I cannot. These shaking hands, my scarred forearms and thinning hair tell me otherwise. The incessant dull ache in my brow, the stoop that I have acquired, and the ever-present sense of dread threatened to consign me to oblivion. I thought that if I knew what you wanted, if I worked and I tried, I could ascertain what it was that you wanted and then I could give it to you, and we would be one again. We would be us. We would be happy. I don't know what you want, but I cannot give it any more. And there is the pity play now, the analysis. I don't know what you want, heaven knows I have tried. Grandiosity, martyrdom. Every day I have spent my time in the pursuit of your happiness. Lie, but not through the narcissistic perspective. The narcissist believes this. Revision of history. It was easy at first because you seemed so happy. Backhanded compliment. The victim probably was happy at first because of the implementation of the golden period. But note the use of seemed to suggest that somehow that the victim was behaving in a fake manner. Projection. I don't think I had seen anybody who had acted in such a carefree manner. Idealization. Nothing seemed to bother you, hold you back or distract you. Flattery. You moved with such intent, acted with defined purpose, and I must confess, I found that attractive. Flattery. The singularity of your aim was evident to even the most casual of observers. Flattery. You shrugged off mishaps, shirked disaster, and dodged catastrophe, as if you had once pledged that you would never countenance anything that could hinder or hold you back. Flattery. 
It is admirable and impressive. Flattery. Note that all of these compliments are talking about how the victim once was. And therefore, this is actually devaluing because the narcissist is saying these are the things you once all were, i.e. implying you no longer are these things. With that ability to glide effortlessly through life, you always seemed happy. Again, the suggestion is it's false, or at least that is what I thought. You made me happy too. Delusion. Of course, the narcissist isn't capable of happiness, but believes that they are. Goodness knows you did. You did it better than anybody else and with such conviction. Idealization. Again, notice past tense, you did it. I can place my hand on my heart and confirm that I have never experienced anybody like you. That's actually a double-edged compliment. On the one hand, it's the idealization that you're special, but there is also the implied suggestion that your treatment of the narcissist is unique in terms of it being unpleasant. Your capacity for love exceeded anything I had witnessed before. Flattery. Everything else paled next to you and your blazing golden sunshine. Flattery. You chased away the gloom. You lit up the darkest of days and you always did so with confidence and fortitude. Flattery. Again, notice the use of the past tense. It was easy to love you. You made it easy. Flattery. Who wouldn't love a god who had deigned to walk on the earth in such a manner? Flattery. Of all of the billions making their way across the planet, you came and you chose me. Grandiosity. Me. Two small letters. You made those letters fill your life and there was no room for anything else. Flattery. Revision of history. Of course, it was the narcissist that selected the victim, not the other way around. But the deluded nature of the narcissist in this instance and the revision of history causes the narcissist to genuinely believe that the victim picked them. Of course, it's intended as a compliment, but the mid-range narcissist invariably doles out compliments, not realising that actually they sound uh, pompous, grandiose, self-absorbed and self-centred. I had never been the focus of such love, attention and affection. Lie. And do you know, I doubt I ever will again. Pity play. There is nobody like you. I meant that as a compliment. I mean that as a compliment. I honestly do. Nobody loved me the way that you did. Backhanded compliment, reference to past tense. I had never been the focus of such love, attention and affection. If I had not seen it happening and felt it envelop me, I would never have believed it, and believe in it I did, with every ounce of my being, grandiosity. You know, I almost felt obliged to love you. Insult. How could I not, after all the things you did for me, and everything that you said? I would surely be a cold-hearted individual to have denied you the most perfect love after what you showed me. I could no less reciprocate what you gave me than walk away, and I fell hard and deep for you, so that it made loving you easy. Grandiosity. Infatuation exhibits the narcissist's belief that they were in love with the victim. I gave everything for you, grandiosity, but if I am honest, at least at first, it was no chore, no arduous exercise or thorny path. Backhanded compliment, because the suggestion is that it has become a chore, has become an arduous exercise, and the narcissist now walks a thorny path. It was bliss. You invigorated me, you elated me, and you inspired me. Grandiosity, flattery. You became the centre of my world, infatuation, and thus I loved you in every conceivable way that I could. Backhanded compliment. With my eyes, my mouth, my fingers, my breath, and my heart. Also represents the way that the narcissist subsumes the individual, the total consumption of the victim to make them an extension of the narcissist. I woke, and the first thing I thought of was you, revision of history. I found you filling my thoughts often and repeatedly, as I considered how best I could return your wonderful love. Possibly the revision of history, or it may well have been that the narcissist did behave in such a way. I sculpted my life around yours. Actually, it was the other way around. I searched for your keys, I supported your endeavours, and I lauded your achievements. 
It's quite possible, given that this is a mid-range narcissist, that those things were done. And either, if they were not, this is the delusion of the narcissist through the revision of history, or there's exaggeration, that the narcissist did some of these things, but not to the extent that they believe that they did. I soothed your fevered brow and held your clammy hand as you slipped into a chaotic slumber. Melodrama. I laundered your clothes, I searched for your keys, I supported your endeavours, and I lauded your achievements. I made myself the best person you could ever want by your side, and I strove each and every day to maintain our happiness for our perfect union. Grandiosity and martyrdom. I invested, I invested everything, martyrdom, I had in our partnership as I wanted to be Robin to your Batman, Hutch to your Starsky, and the Sundance Kid to your Butch Cassidy. Magical thinking. I portrayed nothing less than the perfect visage, visage to all of those who admire you. Grandi grandiosity. Facade management. The bended knee people, the hand kissers, the bowing people, and those at your elbow and over your shoulders. Contempt. I gave them no reason to doubt us, to doubt you. Lack of accountability, blame shifting. I smiled when the pain tried to prevent me from doing so, martyrdom. I blinked back the tears when they wanted to pour, pity. I searched for answers, even when I began to realise that none would be forthcoming, pity play. You made me twist, turn and dangle as you had me like Don Quixote, tilting at those windmills because they might be dragons, blame shifting. Insult. You made me think that enemies lurked around behind every corner. Paranoia, blame shifting. Their long fingered jealousy, ready to steal what we had. I searched for them, ready to strike them down in furtherance of what we have, grandiosity, because I believed in you and I. I gave every, no use of every, minute of every day to you, revision of history, martyrdom. I cancelled my plans, I let friends loose, and irked my family in order to give you what I thought you wanted most likely revision of history. I cleaned, I worked, I bathed, I trimmed, I cut, I dieted, I measured, I washed, and I did so all because of you. Possibly revision of history, and most likely exaggeration. I had come so far along the road with you that I was not going to stop because somehow I knew that we would succeed. All I had to do was find what it was that you wanted. And that is me, you see. I'm a giver and you a receiver. Blame shifting. Also, the perception in the mind of the narcissist that they are the good person, that they are, in fact, the empath. That does not pain me, because I have spent most of my life being a provider, martyrdom, and a giver, martyrdom. That is why I was put on the earth, grandiosity, to care, to worry, to look after, and to cherish. That is my role, and I have discharged myself in this role with utter dedication and distinction, grandiosity. I know I can lie straight in the bed implying that the victim can't and that they're a bad person, even more so because you no longer frequent it with me, blame shifting, and do so in the knowledge that I have done everything that I could for you, blame shifting, martyrdom. You could not want for more. You could not want for a better person than I. You were the best for me, and I wanted to be the best for you too, grandiosity. They say that when you are going through hell, you should keep on going, but I cannot. Pity play. These shaking hands, my scarred forearms, and thinning hair tell me otherwise. Pity play. The incessant dull ache in my brow, the stoop that I have acquired in the ever-present sense of dread, threatened to consign me to oblivion. Melodrama. I thought that if I knew what you wanted, if I worked and tried, I could ascertain that it was, that I could ascertain what it was that you wanted, and then I could give it to you, and we would be one again. Grandiosity, martyrdom. We would be us. We would be happy. I don't know what you want, but I cannot give it any more. This narcissist is indulging in a huge pity play, actually a sympathy symphony, which is a collection of various narcissistic indicators, as I have described. This individual will think that they're an empath, they think that they're a really good person and they don't see where they are blame shifting, where they are lying, where they are exaggerating, where they are behaving with grandiosity and inflated sense of self. They are completely blinded to it. They think that they've done everything they possibly could to make the relationship a good one. And they are completely blind to their failings and shortcomings, both in terms of 
The obviously bad behaviour, for example, this individual will have doled out triangulation, silent treatment, insults, provocation, word salads, circular conversations, etc. But also in terms of not realising how their behaviour when they thought they were being pleasant and good and kind wasn't actually that, but was controlling. This is a very clear example of a mid-range narcissist that believes that they are a good person and categorizes very closely with the behavior of a middle middle range type A. But you would see this amongst other types of mid-ranger as well, perhaps with some slight adjustments. Recognize that this is what is occurring. Also understand this. How is it that the narcissist is able to say all of this to such a degree and with such conviction? Well, they are blinded to who they are. That's the way that the narcissism works. They are unaware. But moreover, the narcissist will have heard these things being said to them by a victim and is therefore appropriating these character traits, applying them to themselves and regurgitating this towards either the same victim, in effect mirroring it back, or acquiring the character traits of what has been said to the narcissist by victim A and then using it in the future as against victim B. Much of these things could actually be said by a true victim of a narcissist towards the narcissist. But in this instance, these are the words that are being used. And you can see used by a narcissist. And therefore, it's very important to understand that with many behaviours that are engaged in, some can be quite similar. They can be performed by the victim and the narcissist. And what you have to do is establish what is that person by looking at a range of behaviour over a period of time. And then you interpret their behaviours through the prism of what they are. So if it's been determined that they're a narcissist, you can then look at everything that's being said here and interpret it as I have done so for you to demonstrate all of the indicators, etc. But also these words, not all of them, but some of them could be said by a victim. A lot of the grandiose stuff would be missing. But talking about having... Uh, love this person and things that have been done for them, etc., will have been said most likely by a victim to the narcissist who has appropriated them for their own use. So this is a very useful example of devaluing behaviour, which is an elongated pity play with lots of narcissistic indicators and dynamics within it, and also demonstrates character trait acquisition and the projection that the narcissist engages in. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.